Here at the Sajikor Cave Hill School of Business and Management, located at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, we meet the needs of the upwardly mobile professionals. Our business school functions in an evolving global space where the need to have that competitive edge distinguishes you as a professional. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of programs that gives you that edge. We offer our students a doctorate in business administration. Then, there's our executive masters in business administration. Our Sajiko Cave School of Business and Management is for you. Enroll now. And good evening. I'm Justin Robinson. I'm the CEO of the Sajiko Cave School of Business and Management at UWI Cave Hill. And it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on the report of the CARICOM Commission on the Private Sector. And it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our guest this evening, the chair of that, Professor Avinash Prasad. I will try to do this with a straight face because he is quite a good friend of mine as well, but we will keep the event serious. So Do we I'm, have to? Yes, I'm, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of his bio, which is always very difficult to do with Professor Passard. So Professor Passard was born in Barbados, the National of Barbados, and his career spans finance, public policy, and academia. He is Emeritus Professor of Gresham College, and an advisor to government on financial policy. And he was the chair of the CARICOM Commission on the Economy and is currently special envoy to Prime Minister Mia Motley on investment and financial services. He is a former senior executive at GAM London State Street, JP Morgan and UBS. He was chairman, regulatory subcommittee of the UN Commission on Financial Reform, chairman of the Warwick Commission, member of the UK Treasury's Audit and Risk Committee, and the Pew Task Force to the US Senate Banking Committee, the visiting scholar at the IMF, European Central Bank, and distinguished advisor, Financial Sector Law Reform Commission of India. He won the Jacks Dealer of C Award in Global Finance from the Institute of International Finance and was voted one of the top three public intellectuals in the world on the financial crisis by a panel for Prospect Magazine. And that's just a sample of his extensive, agree uh, extensive achievements. A true Caribbean son of the soil. And it gives me tremendous pleasure really that he's taken time from his busy schedule to be here with us. I'm gonna start by giving a brief overview of where we are in the Caribbean and why I think today's discussion is so important. So in 1969, average income per head in CARICOM nations was four times that of other small states worldwide. 50 years later, our average income per head is a fraction of other small states and is still falling. We have moved from the monoculture of sugar to a very limited diversification. Decline begets decline. Slow growth and runaway environmental costs have led to large debt levels and little fiscal room to manage climate and health issues. Our bright and young keep us in increasing proportion. Fiscal costs from tertiary immigration is 13% of GDP, while remittances add 2% a year. Despite poor productivity, growth has become jobless. The region would have to grow by 12% per annum for five years to end unemployment. The risks are greater. If our economies cannot deliver jobs, cannot deliver opportunity, cannot deliver purpose for those on the blocks and in the field, then something more elemental than GDP deficits and debt is at risk. Our social community, our social fabric, and our stability are at risk. Does that sound familiar to you, Professor Patas? <laughs> yes, it does. Okay, so again, those are your own words, and I couldn't think of better words to really frame the situation and the environment we are in. So while we are in the immediacy 
of a pandemic, now of a volcanic eruption. As a nationalist in Vincent, my head is whirling from what we're calling this triple whammy of COVID, volcano, and the worst dengue outbreak we've had in decades. So while that is an immediate challenge and maybe a catalyst for reform, the decline of the region has, that rot has set in for a long time. And I know Professor Passard and myself, we are of the view that while there is a massive role for governments to play, key to really having sustainable growth is, private, is, is the private sector. So this commission on the private sector, I think, is quite timely. And I think we don't make any apologies in that while we see the key role for government, the private sector needs to be a key engine, if not the key engine of growth, if we're going to have sustainable growth for our people. So I'm going to start by asking you, Professor Pustard, can you give an overview for us of this report, your assignment, and the terms of reference, please? Thank you very much, Justin. And, um, you know, when you began, I was getting a little bit nervous because I was thinking, I can't disagree with what you're saying. Uh, and it was only after a few minutes I realized that this was the Commission's report. You, you, you kindly said, uh, my words, and, and I may have uh, produced a draft, but of course, this is a commission, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the commissioners, but um, what was our remit? Our remit really relates to some of that, some of that history you talked about. So from, from independence to the mid-1980s, uh, we as a region were outperforming others. Uh, we were fulfilling our ambition from independence. Uh, we put it down to significant investment in public education. So this growth also mapped well onto our sense of, of value. So we were going to invest in education for our people, and this would deliver growth. And from the 60s to the mid-1980s, that's what it did. We also benefited, I think, from uh, quite affirming commodity prices. Uh, and we benefited, uh, although we didn't realize at the time, we benefited from instability almost everywhere else. We took democracy for granted back then. But if you look at our neighbors in Latin America, uh, democracy was, was, did not frequently visit that, that continent in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So we did well, partly because the rest of the world was looking at very dodgy, unstable, undemocratic, uncertain place. And then we were investing heavily in public education uh, and we were coming from a fairly lowish base from what we could achieve. But from the mid to late 1980s, we have begun underperforming the rest of the world. In part, that is the rest of the world got its act together. China the first, India a decade later, began really shooting the lights out and uh, Chinese growth, which began uh, around the mid to late 1980s, China has had the greatest growth spurt in history. We don't have any historical records of another country growing that fast for that long. And other countries around China, benefiting from Chinese growth, Chinese sucking in demand, did, did really well. We also suffered, I think, from natural disasters. We had a, 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 some pretty awful uh, hurricanes and... and um, uh, and, and other natural disasters, and a fair bit of fiscal costs uh, began to build up from then. But well, one of our commissioners is, is uh, uh, Dr. Damon King, um, who wrote some, uh, some, did some great research uh, on how much of the public debt in the Caribbean can be put down to natural disasters. So things that weren't really our fault, it wasn't spendthrift governments, it was governments responding to something external. Uh, and that was a major factor in, in, in a number of countries. And then the other thing which happened was that our preferential trade uh, agreements began getting dismantled. They became illegal under WTO. We signed up to WTO uh, and we got some benefits from that, some investment, but ultimately uh, we, we weren't able to capture the advantage. So from the mid to late 1980s, for a long arc now, we've been underperforming. We are now uh, the region 
with the greatest indebtedness. We're now the region with the slowest growth. And we're now the region with some of the highest non-communicable diseases. So a real public health uh, disaster out there. Uh, and so uh, those, that is the background to why the heads of government of the CARICOM countries said we need a, uh, a commission on the economy, how we're going to revitalize the economy, how we're going to reimagine our economic development. Uh, and uh, we set out our, set about our task in um, in late 2018, early 2019. It's been a fairly eventful 24 months. Um, we we uh, we came. We began just after the awful hurricane season of 2017, uh, when countries like uh, like Dominica and BVI uh, and Antigua were, were you know, decimated. Dominica lost 226% of GDP. I, I was asked to, to give them some, some support after that hurricane. And I remember going around telling people. Is that possible, Professor Passant? Sorry? Is that mathematically possible? <laughs> well, yes. I, Justin, as you say, a lot of people looked at me when I said 226% of GDP, and they thought, well, how can you do that? But of course, GDP is the amount of income that you earn in a year. Uh, so you can lose more than one year's income. Uh, and they lost a lot of their infrastructure, their bridges. It's a land of water and rivers, and they lost a lot of bridges uh, and roads. Uh, so we began with that shadow, and then, of course, we ended with COVID. But I have to say, in retrospect, that COVID, uh, that awful tragedy that we're always going to remember for the rest of our lives, did cause a certain amount of, of reflection, thinking about, you know, what is like, well, all, all of us, I think, are stuck at home, uh, in the curtilage of our home, as they say here in Barbados, um, by law, had to reflect on, on life, what's important in life, what's valuable in life. And we had the most uh, amazing economic experiment. If someone had said to you, what would happen to Antigua and Barbados if you switched off tourism? We would say, well, we've no idea. Uh, uh, how could we know that? Um, and, um, uh, and of course, we, we, saw, we saw what happened. Um, and so, in a way, the commission, I think, really came into its own and became more radical in our last 12 months when we were, when we were seeing the impact of COVID. Uh, and we began drawing some conclusions that we basically need a single digital space in the Caribbean, that we have long toiled uh, in, uh, in, in the fields of trying to create a single uh, market. We have stumbled because of some uh, sometimes political issues, sometimes logistical issues, uh, sometimes minor sectoral issues and disputes. But we have an opportunity. We have a once in a generation opportunity to, to have COVID behind us and to say we can be a single digital space, uh, that we can sell and buy goods across the Caribbean online. And the world is already moving there. there. This is the shift to the world. Automation means that manufacturing is now being done by robots. And because they're being done by robots and not by people, the manufacturers are being located next to markets, not where people are. And so not where the laborers are. And so that opportunity that we may have had to be a manufacturing exporter really has gone. We have to be a global services exporter for the world. We have to sit at home or in modern offices uh, and export professional services down a fast broadband connection. But if we do that, we would be um, on track with the way the world is, but we wouldn't be dominating the world. We would be, be a good consumer of this new global digital world. How do we become a great producer in this new global digital world? And for that, we really need to, to, government needs to play a role, I think, in helping to support the creation of some markets where we are uh, big producers. Now, let me end with, 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 with this one example. Um, one of the things I, I've done uh, recently is being on the board of the National Insurance Scheme of Barbados across the region. Uh, well, you, you, Justin, were a former chair of the NIS, so you, you will know this story. Um, and the NIS spent, uh, and there are you know, uh, a dozen or so 
similar institutions around the Caribbean. And if you add up how much these institutions have spent in the past decade on software, accounting software, IT software, it's over $1 billion. And yet, all of that stuff we import from abroad because we'd say we don't have a big enough market here to create software producers uh, and coders and app uh, producers. Well, if we procured as one group, if we had annual prizes for great coding and apps and said that whoever won those prizes were automatically intenders, uh, for procurement of software, we might be able to create an industry that could then uh, be global. This isn't quite an infant industry argument. This is saying, let's take the market we have and organize it in such a way that actually supports local producers. And let us use prizes and other things to help ignite the ingenuity of our people. Our people are very ingenious in the creative industries. They can be very ingenious in all aspects of life. So thanks very much for that introduction. And I'm gonna ask the audience, please ignore if you see me sweating a little bit because I'm in my house. I can't open any of my windows because of the dust. I can't turn on my AC. So I'm working with a fan, but I want to start by pushing you a little bit on that digital, digital aspect because in a way it's front of our mind and you mentioned the NIS example. I always remember what for me was a funny story as a new member on the board. First board meeting, one of the big issues was that the NIS was several years behind with its audited financial statements. And I started asking some questions and I was told, well, you know, there are all of these bank reconciliations that haven't been done. And when I checked, you know, the NIS was writing several thousand checks every two weeks. We were writing almost a million checks a year. And I said, being naive, said, but why don't we do this as direct debits to people's bank accounts? And we tried to introduce it. And for those of you who are not familiar with Barbados, I was almost shipped back to St. Vincent on the call. <laughs> I still try to do this, but COVID has forced us into this new digital environment. This is my second semester giving all of my lectures online. So in terms of the report, the commission's report, are there any specific, because it, it's easy to talk about this single global space. COVID has forced us to do some things online. Are we gonna be able to really keep those gains? So in terms of the report, are there any specific actions or recommendations coming out of your report to really foster the development and the maintenance, the development of this global, this online space across the region. It's, it's a great point. And I should say that uh, having taken on your mantle at the National Insurance uh, Board, uh, we, we are sending many more payments uh, digitally, but still, it is still the largest producer of checks in the country. Uh, and there's always a story against against uh, modernizing you know um uh, we're always told that okay that that you're being selfish to think to do such a thing because uh, elderly people are unable to manage with uh, such digital gadgets and um how will they cope and we need to keep on sending we keep on need to keep on writing checks so that they can receive their payment well you know i remember my, my father who was a a senior sort of international economist um, always had uh, uh, secretaries in his, in his office. Indeed, when he became a director of the Economic Affairs Division, I think he had two secretaries in his office. Uh, but, you know, it took one year of uh, retirement and not having any background. And he was there busy writing all his own letters. And after when COVID struck, I think my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law used online shopping for the first time and far more than I ever did. And they were very adept to getting it to delivered at home um, uh, in their in their you know mid seventies. And so, I think some of these obstacles are overplayed. You talked about uh, some practical things in the report, and the report cites uh, a number of things, but there are three things that come to mind. So let's say we want to be sitting in our homes 
and digitally importing and exporting across the Caribbean. Well, the first thing we would need is mutual recognition of standards, right? So, you know, I've got a qualification, you have a qualification, uh, and the country we're trying to export to says, oh, we don't accept that qualification. Let's say you're a lawyer, let's say you're an accountant, let's say you are an architect, let's say you are uh, a medical diagnostic. We need to make sure that we have mutually mutual recognition for our qualifications. And so we recommend in the report that we establish uh, a board that will go through rapidly uh, all the different things in which we can establish a minimum standard. Uh, and as long as you are exceeding this minimum standard, we can mutually, uh, countries are exceeding that minimum standard in their standards, we can all mutually rec recognize. Them. Uh, and we believe that uh, that can operate, operate not just for things like professional qualifications, but things like financial conduct rules, right? A, a lot of, uh, you may have a financial firm in one country uh, and it can't easily uh, sell goods in another country. It has to go through the entire process again um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being, being, um, being approved, often in small markets. So they're thinking, well, why bother? This market's too small. But if we had a single mutual recognition, we would all have much greater financial product, more competition. I mean, how many different places are there to put for, for a saver to put their money in? Savers get almost no deals. Um, and that's because there's so there's so little competition in that market. So the first thing is mutual recognition of international standards, uh, of regional standards. Um, the second thing is we need to have some rules on data, the cost of data flying between countries. So um, governments have been in negotiation with the two biggest telecoms companies. Um, this is part of, of using muscular regulation to try and help create a market. If we really want a digital single space, it's got to be cheap to move data. So we need to tell our telecoms companies, if you want to have a license to operate in our region, one of the quid pro quos there is we're not going to make you lose money, but there needs to be some standardization, a single data roaming charge. And actually the the telecoms companies have, um, to be fair to them, they have they have received that uh, with um, with a certain amount of, of welcoming. So I think we are not far off that uh, goal. The third thing we need to have is we need to create a new type of digital employment contract. So here I am working in Barbados and selling my goods to Jamaica, say. Where does the Jamaican firm that I work for contribute its national insurance payments? To Jamaica or to Barbados? And so we need, uh, where, where do they, uh, where are all the taxes being paid? Now there are agreements on where the allocation of taxes are. We don't have agreements on the allocation of social security benefits. And I think it's very important, Justin, that in this digital world, that we find a way of embedding the social safety net because the, the gig economy, you know, where we're all sort of um, working on an app uh, in, uh, with a zero hour contract can actually erode labor rights. And so we need to really embed social security, social insurance into the new digital contract. So those are three things, mutual recognition, uh, single uh, inexpensive data roaming charges. Uh, and thirdly, um, new digital co employment contracts to allow people all over the region to work and social security contributions to be made. Okay, so again, thanks for that. And, and would you say I'm correct? In terms of thinking of the report, and it's an extensive report, when I look at the report, I think I see two big ideas. One being that digital revolution across the region. And the second being the sustainability built around energy independence as well as sustainable building. So I want to pivot quickly from the digital aspect of it to that sustainability aspect. And maybe if we can break it into two aspects. One that is kind of very much at the top of my mind, being from St. Vincent, where we've seen that devastation from the volcano. At some point, hopefully, people get the all clear and persons are going back into those affected areas and people are looking to rebuild homes. 
fresh with Dominica in my mind. How does this report, if at all, address mechanisms by which the region can build sustain so that, that, we, that we can build back better, but not just more than build back better because build back comes after a crisis, but how do we have sustainability in like aspects of our housing stock and infrastructure across the region? Because as you mentioned earlier, that's a massive part of our heavy indebtedness because of responding. So how does the report deal with that issue? Well, well let me begin, uh, Justin, uh, uh, on a slight detour and get to your, your point. The slight detour is that we are just coming off the April spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank. Uh, Prime Minister Motley is a current chair of the Development Committee. So that's a committee of all of the developing nations that present developing issues uh, to the IMF and World Bank. And disaster, Natural disasters has been on top of the agenda. And one of the things that has been developing that is, is mentioned in the report, but already has become a major factor in our lobby, has been natural disaster clauses in all of our debts. So we put this into the, the Barbados debt. Uh, we, we are actually, uh, Barbados is the world's largest issuer of sovereign bonds with natural disaster clauses. Uh, so when people think of us as being behind the times, there are some things we are well ahead of the times. So we're saying that every debt agreement from the official sector, public sector, private sector, should have these natural disaster clauses in them. Now, what happens in these natural disasters? Uh, what do these clauses do? What they do is they make the fact that when you have a natural disaster of a certain size, sort of you know, transformational impact, sucker punch, that automatically, without you having to ask, when an independent meteorological agency has declared the disaster has occurred, for instance, that two years of interest payments and debt repayments are automatically shifted to the end of the loan agreement. So you have two years of interest and principal payments free to basically give you the space in order to deal with the crisis. In the case of Barbados, that will free up 7% of GDP. That's a big chunk of money. So we are pushing and, and uh, doing international advocacy to try and put this in all of the debt contracts all over the world using our example. But in the report, we also point out that to build resilience, as you said, so there's, there's dealing with a natural disaster, but what about making sure that we are more resilient. Now, many of the reinsurance companies in the world live in the northern parts of the world. They're headquartered in Hamburg and Hanover and Zurich. Uh, you may know the names, uh, Munich Re, Zurich Re, Swiss Re. Uh, and so they look from their perspective, climate change um, is, is, is a bit of a marginal thing for them. It's something that they worry about, they, they fear, it might impact 1% of GDP. And so they come along, they say, oh, you should insure yourself against it. Well, the thing is that climate change will impact everybody, but it's actually impacting uh, a, the, the, those countries that lie south of the Tropic of Cancer and north of the Tropic of Capricorn. That belt around the world's, the world's equator is in the front line of climate change. That's where there's been the greatest insufferable rise in temperatures, the greatest increase in sea level rising. You know, as, as a humble uh, economist, um, uh, as, as, like you, just you know, when we study economics, we don't do a lot of physical science. So when it was first put to me that when the polar ice caps melt, the sea level does not rise there. In fact, the solar ice caps melting lifts the land. There is a drop in sea level. Because the earth spins, that water ends up on the equator. And so we are going to have the biggest increase in sea levels as a result of the polar ice caps melting. So this, uh, this is an uninsurable event. It's a very important point. It is a rising risk of a wipeout event that is increasingly correlated with other disasters. 
I can't insure against sea level rising by trying to match um, my uh, using uh, other people who are insured against floods because flooding and sea level rising and sea level temperature increases and droughts are all being correlated with climate change. So this is an uninsurable event. So what's the only way are we going to deal with climate change? We have to build in a resilient way. And building in a resilient way can be much more expensive. Not always. I, I learned a, a lot in, in the work I did in Dominica. We were there trying to design you know, uh, uh, stronger and stronger bridges, right? Bridges that can withstand a category three, category four, category five. And then somebody said, why don't we build a collapsible bridge? We always have three hours notice before a hurricane. We could collapse the bridge, wait for the hurricane, open it back out again. So building things resiliently does not always mean more expensively. It means smart, but it, but it does mean rebuilding. And I reckon, the commission reckons, that the amount of building we need, $20 billion, 20 billion US dollars at a minimum. The governments can't afford that the most highly indebted region in the world. We're trying to get the international sector to support us. We didn't contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Those who did should be helping, but they're not. So we need a plan B. Uh, and the plan B is that we need to find ways of involving the private sector into building resilience that generates revenues, either through cost savings, uh, uh, for example, let us say we underground uh, all of the utilities. Uh, therefore, when a hurricane hits, then these we do not need to spend a big chunk of GDP rewiring the country. Now, undergrounding is really expensive. But maybe if we underground the electricity pylons with the with, with electricity cables, with the telephone cables, separately uh, next door in, a, in, in, in conduits running parallel, water and gas and all these other things, rebuilding the roads at the same time, maybe we can make it cheaper, make cost savings, and therefore maybe the private sector will be prepared to invest in this and get a return. And that is the way we might be able to spend $20 billion in making ourselves the first climate resilient region in the world. One of the things I wanted to push a bit on related to that, because this sustainable build out very well be almost like an equivalent of a Marshall Plan for the region, something that is really a Philip that can drive private sector growth for a long time. In the report, you speak to this resilient bond, this, 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 this resilient bond offering, these resilient bonds. Can you elaborate a little bit on these resilient bonds for our, for our audience? Sure. So, I mean, the back, the background is that when you know when when the when we were all in the negotiating room in Paris, um, the um, the developing countries and small islands were promised that if they support the Paris Accord on climate change, on trying to limit greenhouse gas emissions, um, then they would create something called the Warsaw Mechanism for loss and damage. They'll create a fund that will help to fund those countries suffering loss and damage. And we signed up to that. And they created the Warsaw Mechanism for loss and damage. And there's not a single cent in the mechanism. So there's no funding. Um, insurance is not the route. And so we have to find this fund. Now, how are we going to find a fund? So we are, you know, this region has two fairly two or three fairly unique things. One of them is we are a developing region, but we have savings. Uh, Justin, when you and I were studying economics, well, one of the challenges for development is how do you get the savings to invest in the things you need to develop? Well, many developing, many developing regions in the world, in Africa uh, in particular, uh, in parts of Asia originally, not today, they didn't have savings. They had to bring savings in. We actually have savings. We have $50 billion of savings in the banking system. We probably have another $25 billion in the, uh, in the insurance um, pension savings system. So we need to move this, mobilize these savings for investment uh, and investment that builds resilience. So we are trying to plan a, uh, a, a new asset class 
uh, the first in the, in, in the world called growth and resilience bonds. And these growth and resilience bonds will be fund managers who sign up to only investing in things that will move the needle on resilience. And we'll have independent assessors uh, of whether this is really sustainable and resilient, and they will sign up to do this. And, and we, as savers, can put our money into these funds. Uh, the fund managers will find good investment opportunities that hit resilience, put our money to work, and we will get more than we're currently getting in a bank deposit uh, because of the returns to be had from building more resiliently, whether that is returns from cost savings uh, or returns from generating revenues. Let us say that governments will, will um, let us say that all the utility companies will contribute some money for undergrounding. And along comes a company who says, well, I'll underground you all together in one place. You can make a return from that. Uh, and the growth and resilience bonds can fund that. So what you will see in the future uh, is a bond being issued. It will explain that this that when you invest in this bond and you'll get this kind of return, say a 5% return, the money will be spent on only approved projects that make the region more resilient to climate change and other natural disasters. Okay, thanks for that. Sounds very exciting. And before this descends into the Southern Robinson show, I'm going to take some questions from well, what's wrong the with the Basaud and, and Robinson show? Okay, no, you're quite right. You know, we actually we need to listen to, listen to some real people. As we often do. So I have a question here from one of our most talented economists in the region, Marla Dukaran. So I'm starting you with a tough one, Avi, you know, because you know if it's coming from Marla, that's, it's a That's tough Marla question. for you, yes. Economic growth in the region should be private sector-led agreed. Yes, we need a single digital space. Yes, we need a single market. How do we overcome a workforce that is deeply suspicious of the private sector and governments that are in the most cases in this region anti-private sector or leftist? How do we overcome these very real and practical constraints? Well, of course, we have mixed economies today. We take Barbados, which is a country that you may say that they are uh, some reticence about the private sector, but 80% of employment is private sector. Um, indeed, I would say we're not necessarily suggesting there should be a shift in that ratio of 80 20. Um, so in a way, it is about maintaining the, 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 the existing mix of our economy, but accepting that we need the private sector to be investing. Now, how do, why would the private sector invest? How do you boost private sector investment? Well, one way of boosting them is to boost their after-tax rate of return. And so that's why corporation tax rates around the region have fallen. Barbados now has the lowest corporate income tax rates, uh, one of the lowest in the world, um, having had one of the highest at 30 percent, uh, is now down to uh, one to five and a half percent. So you can boost the after tax rate of return you get from the private sector investing. But we also need to, uh, I think, skillfully use the state to help create markets. Uh, so, for example, uh, Mal has been doing a lot of great work in trying to create a single settlement uh, mechanism within the Caribbean uh, and to create these single payment systems and, uh, and digitally enabled things we, we need to have proper regulation we need to define the boundary right so what is well, who is a who is a who, who is an approved payments uh, 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 you know entity that can actually take your payments because they've been regulated in such a way that when they take your payment to give it to someone else they don't run off and and and, uh, and, and steal your payment so they needs to have so we need to the, the state needs to play a role in helping to support and create these markets we talked earlier about the procurement market there is no local procurement market even though we spend a billion dollars on procuring software so the state needs to find a way of organizing that market, not state money, but state organization, whether it's through prizes, whether it is through um, coordinating local procurement. There is a procurement act within CARICOM that needs to be passed. It's an act which says that whenever the state is procuring something, they need to open themselves up 
to other firms all over the region. And we will suddenly create a massive procurement market. Uh, and, uh, and this will allow the private sector to invest behind it. We, we also need to, um, to make sure that, that the private sector is, is uh, not expecting to live off great government contracts. Uh, so we need to minimize some of those government contracts, minimize the, the rate of return, uh, and so to push the private sector back into focusing on making money from being competitive rather than from lobbying governments hard. Okay, thanks for that. I'm trying to see if my assistants here can allow us to unmute Marla to see whether she can actually make sure that we answer her question clearly. Is that possible, Pamela? That, that, that's a frightening thought. <laughs> I'm trying to find her, but she's not showing up by her name. Marla, are you still online? Okay, we, there are also a couple of questions in the chat from Jerry Blenman. So can we find him? Might be easier if he can verbalize one or two of the questions. Pam, can you find him? Good evening, Jerry. He's allowed to speak. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. I think you are unmuted. Go ahead, Jerry. It, I think this is what Marla meant about us being reticent with, with rules and officialdom. You know, Pamela said, Jerry, you are allowed to speak, but Jerry was still too afraid uh, of speaking. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. Can you hear We're me? All ears. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Good. Wonderful. Yeah, my, my, my first concern was that of how we manage our resources across the region and uh, do so from a cost perspective. And I think we are well aware of the fact that we are a resource scarce region and that the cost of actually running the region is extremely high. At the same time, we have low productivity levels and we have the issue of waste. And bringing that into the equation so that what we have available to us is properly managed uh, you know, I think it's important. And I just, was just wondering where, where that fits into the entire uh, narrative with regards to transform, building resilience and using our resources to effectively facilitate growth uh, in, in the future. It's a, it's a great point, Jerry. And I think one of the ways that will get us there more quickly is understanding, you know, er, er, earlier, I think we, just Justin asked me about whether you can lose 226% of your GDP. And I, I reminded, uh, I didn't need to remind anyone, but I, I pointed out that, uh, that GDP is your, your income. And we tend to think a lot about income and GDP. We need to think about the balance sheet, not the income sheet, the balance sheet. Because when we do that, then we start to realize that we need to conserve our resources. That if you make GDP in a year by uh, eating up all of your resources in a way that's non-reusable, that's not helpful. And so we need to, uh, all, all of our countries need to start thinking uh, in terms of a balance sheet and publishing a balance sheet, a balance sheet which includes all of their physical assets, their intangible assets, their natural assets, their natural capital. Our beaches in Barbados are part of our balance sheet. And we have to make sure that we don't so abuse them that we use them up that they can't be used again. Uh, and the same for our natural environment. So we need to think about the natural environment as an asset uh, that we cannot waste away uh, just to get income in one year. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to make sure we are not overly subsidizing the use of these resources. So there used to be a fashion in the region, uh, which economists used to argue against, but politicians don't really like the argument, that we should subsidize petrol, we should subsidize fuel, because fuel is used for everything they say, uh, and if you don't subsidize fuel, that the poor person can't get to work. Well, our subsidies of fuel means we are polluting our environment. 
Uh, and so uh, one way in which we can use scarce resources better is making sure they're not too cheap, that the price of the scarcity is implicit in, in how much it costs. So we need to remove subsidies on the use of scarce resources. We need to think of a balance sheet. Now, of course, we want to promote at the same time renewable energy. And so we are going to have to begin with some subsidies to producers to get them to invest in something that we've never had before. So, you know, you're, you're going to say to a, a solar farm, uh, which has never ever uh, in a country that's never, ever had a 20 year contract for solar farms. Here's a 20 year contract where well, they're going to say, well, I don't know whether this 20 year contract means 20 years and I'm going to spend all this money building this farm, what happens if 10 years later you, 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 know, you, you cancel it? You say there's some other new technology that's come along. And so in this, to try and defeat this uncertainty, our solar contracts are going to have to be even more attractive than might be commercially the, the cheapest price if there was no uncertainty. So we will have some, in, some subsidies to get renewable energy going first. And therefore, we need a new kind of contract, Jerry, which allows for the subsidy to get investment going, but can ratchet down, lower the price of, of, of solar energy, as long as the investor is making some threshold investment. So we don't turn around and say, now you're making money, we're taking it all away, because that's not going to encourage any investment. But we say, well, you know, you, you invested thinking you were going to make a 15% return. That's a great return. You're making 25%. So you know, we want to lower the price to the consumer benefits from this, but we will make sure that you still are making your minimum 15% return. So we need some new contracts. We need to stop subsidizing, wasting our natural resources. We need to account you know, that they say that, that, that it, it's not taken into account if you don't measure it. We need to account for our natural capital. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, thanks for that, Jerry. And I see also a comment in the chat from Arlivea Harper. Do you, do you prefer if I read your question or you want to come onto the floor? Harper, Olivier Harper. Okay, so the hand is raised, so the person's going to speak. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Good evening, Dr. Prasad. Justin, evening. how are you doing? All right. Well, my question had pertained to your talking about the digital aspect of things. As a, as a person who has had different and uh, varying levels of communication cap, uh, skill sets, I've been involved in the communications industry in and out for about 20, 25 years in the region. Um, one of the biggest impediments we've seen is a lack of investment by ISPs to move in, in not only time, but also not only in timing of their launches, but in actual equipment and living up to day. And when they do launch, living up to the aspects of what they say they can do. Because then you go ahead and you keep telling people in the international markets, I can deliver X, Y, Z uh, electronic service in X, Y time, but yet the ISP seem not to have the redundancies built in, one. They're not able to deliver the bandwidth that they said they could, two. And three, they keep raising prices for the same set of services <laughs> that they're already providing. Uh, so what is it that can be done on a policy level to get the ISPs to really step up to the plate properly so that we can really see the benefits of a gig economy and take advantage of IoT as we go forward past this pandemic um, situation that we're looking at? Well, uh, Lavera, I think you, you're, you're using some, some jargon and acronyms, and so not all of our audience are going to understand. I'm not sure that I always understand them myself, but I think if I understand your question, uh, one of the things you're saying is central to this digital world is uh, the, 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 cup, the firms that are critical to delivering uh, broadband, whether it's the expense and the capacity and some of those people critical to the plumbing 
like the internet service providers and the, the, the organizations that get us access onto the web, they, uh, we don't have a very competitive environment. They, they charge a lot. They don't always deliver great service and they can repeat, start sort of double counting the charges, I, I think is one of the things you're, you're saying. Well, I think that one of the challenges is that this is an industry that needs good regulation. And um, the, 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 the companies are regional and we regulate nationally. And so I think we need to invest in a single regional regulator. We have a single regional regulator uh, in Suriname, but it, ha it is pretty toothless at the moment. And I think we need to consider folding in some of our regulatory uh, activities done nationally to the regional regulator, where the, the industry that they're dealing with is regional rather than national. Now, uh, I, I think that um, the, 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 the main providers, and I've been negotiating with them on a single data roaming uh, charge, are open-minded to um, some kind of compact. Uh, because they want certainty as well. Uh, and so I think that we need to, the, the regulators need to step up to the plate and develop what is that compact that is in the long-term developmental benefit to our people and our countries. Uh, and I don't think we're doing that. And as a result, we could sometimes get abused. Um, it's a fast, it's, it's an environment with, great, with fast technology. And so uh, many of these companies are having to invest in new technology and spend new money, and they're really reluctant to do that. We need regulators that reach good agreements. And I don't think at the moment we have the best agreements. Okay, excellent. So I have three other persons. I'm going to call three persons in the queue. So then there's Crystal Drake, who has a question. So, we, so Crystal, we are opening up to you next. Then there's Calvin Chase, who has a question in the chat. And then Fitzgerald Yaw. Those are the three persons I have in the queue. So, Crystal? Thank you, Professor Robinson. Can you hear me? Very Out clearly. OK, perfect. Um, thank you very much. Um, Professor Prasad, thank you for your uh, interesting discussion. And my question, I guess, is similar to Jerry's, but I'm, I'm going to ask you something in a, in a different context. Uh, we, you spoke about uh, the need to mobilize the savings in the region. I think you mentioned it's about $50 billion. Um, and also this move towards resilient bonds. Is there room then also for the use of green or transition bonds and sustainability linked loans to mobilize the private sector in a way that it becomes more circular in nature? Because we know a lot of the business practices at the moment are not sustainable or they're unsustainable, I should say. And what we've seen is that growth in the past, particularly like you've mentioned before in China, that growth has come at the expense of severe environmental degradation and also social inequality. So my question is, can we in some way mobilize new financial instruments um, that leads to more circular investment because I think the Caribbean has the potential to leapfrog what I call this environmental economic conundrum as SIDS. Um, but we do have these, these challenges such as these high debt levels um, and low productivity, for instance. So what are your thoughts on that? Because the UNEP uh, recently brought out a report entitled Financing Circularity. And some of the, the concepts in there are very interesting. And I, and I just wanted your thoughts on green transition bonds and sustainability linked loans to drive circular investment, particularly in the private sector. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you very much, Senator Drapes. Uh, and let me begin by saying that you've been doing some great work in bringing donut economics and, and other circular type issues uh, to the region uh, and a greater understanding of these to, to the region. I really want to, to hail you for doing that. I think these are some very important issues, the, the, the notion of sustainability, and we need uh, a new kind of thinking uh, to support sustainability. Now, um, I think that one has to be, I, 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 I'm a, a finance guy, and, and my dream was in fact to, to, to be a development economist. Uh, and I was, um, 
uh, I, I, I uh, left university, London School of Economics, and the plan was to work in, in finance briefly, earn a savings, and then move to, to, to work for the World Bank and other places as a development economist. But then I found that finance was really quite exciting. And worse, um, all my development economist friends wanted to know more about finance. And, and finance is sometimes seen as overly sexy. Um, and I have to say, as a finance guy, that finance, in financial instruments always seem very sophisticated and interesting, but it's seldom that they are, that, that they are the solution. Now, they can be the solution um, when, they, when they deliver something different. So, so what, what are we trying to deliver here? There, there, is, there, is, there is sustainability that we have to deliver for people who cannot pay for it. So for the lowest income, poor people, the state needs to be building climate resilient homes uh, and, and giving them climate resilient and natural disaster insurance. But there's a whole set of people who can pay for it and are prepared to pay for uh, greater resilience. Um, how do we deliver, so we could use financial instruments for which they can, they, they can do that, but how do we make, how do we use the financial instrument to, to make the cost of funding circularity and sustainability cheaper? I think that one way is if we can reduce the uncertainty by, by greater classification. So impact investors who want to make a return not only financially, but also socially, would be prepared to buy these green bonds, transformation bonds, growth resilience bonds, whatever we call them, uh, and prepared to, to buy them getting a lower rate of return if it's clear to them what we're using the money for. And so we're gonna need to create an industry that classifies activities, that ranks and rates activity, maybe a new kind of credit rating agency that's not about credit, but about sustainability. And once we can rate projects by sustainability, a fund manager can say, I'm going to use this bond, whatever I've called it, the green bond, the transformation bond, to only invest in things that have a five-star sustainability rating or a five-star circularity rating. And then that may attract public money, impact investors who are prepared to invest uh, not for a non-commercial rate of return. So they're prepared to buy the bond, even if it's only got a 3% rate of return, because they're making 3% financially, plus they're making a social impact. Now, if they are prepared to do that, I now can fund these projects. These, these projects, which are going to create sustainability and circularity, I've now got cheaper funding. And with cheaper funding, I can do more of them and I can do it bigger. So I think that will be the way to do it. What we're missing is the intermediary so far. So I don't think we're missing the financial instrument. We're missing the intermediary who will rate, who will create uh, ratings and rankings of sustainability and circularity. And perhaps, Crystal, uh, given the, the, the organizations you are part of, maybe one of the things that the Blue Green Initiative and others could do is get in the business of rating projects by their circularity and sustainability. And then fund managers will say, well, I will take these ratings and I will only invest in, in things above this rating. And then we can attract the social impact investors to buy the bonds and, and cheaper funding. And that way we can fund sustainability. Okay, so I think next we had Colvin Case, I think, who had a, a question. Chase, and then we have um, Yaw, who was waiting. Fitzgerald Yaw. So Chase, are you going to come on or we move to Yaw? Is Colvin waiting for Pamela to give him permission? I have been trying. You've been trying and, and I've been trying to unmute him, but he's not allowing me to unmute him. So we might need to have Oh my him. lord. Okay. We, so as a, so we as a people are deliberately muting ourselves. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so so let's move to Fitzgerald then. And then we have Yeah, so let, let's take Fitzgerald. So Fitzgerald, we're hoping that you have uh, chosen with your own agency to unmute yourself and we're keen to hear what you have to say. <laughs>
we the people are still trying. Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, he has chosen not to Okay, oh, hello? Yes. Yes, oh, here yes. he is. Hello, we can hear you. Hi. Hi, right, good day, good day. Yeah, good day. okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm glad I was able to join this event. I just want to put out something. And uh, Professor Prasad, I think I worked with your father. Your father is Professor Bishop Prasad, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I work with him at the University of the Center for Environment and Development. My um issue, I, you know, is something I'm always flagging. This report is a CARICOM report. But to me, the challenge of CARICOM is that we have to face, um, we have a lot of countries that have been independent for over 50 years, and sovereignty, I think, is our major challenge. It's something we have to wrap our hands around, our heads around, if we want to move forward. Um, the, you mentioned in the beginning um, the NIS schemes around the country, about 12. Uh, Professor Robinson noted he was chairman, I think, of the, I don't know if it was the Barbados NIS. And... Um, Think of it, 12 NIS schemes, 12 heads in this region with the natural, the human resources challenges. Think of civil aviation. We have about five civil aviation authorities, five heads, you know? And the, actually, currently, the head of the Guyana Civil Aviation Authority was actually a deputy at a Jamaican agency, you know? Um, so we are duplicating in terms of governments, bank governors, you know, we duplicate our, our human resources, um, wasting them, I think. And, um, Really, I think that's the key to our sustainability, getting, wrapping our heads around the sovereignty issue. And it comes back to what you, I think Justin mentioned earlier, the creation of, for example, a regional digital space. I give an example, I'll stop here. I lived in Edmonton for a while, Edmonton, Alberta. I had a national cell, no, I had a North American cell phone plan. That plan allowed me to call anywhere in North America from, um, from Massachusetts to Hawaii. Hawaii was in North America for my plan, Hawaii. So I could have stayed in Edmonton, called Hawaii and speak unlimited. While if I went to Miami and called Jamaica, suddenly I was international. And while if I were in Miami and called Puerto Rico, I still was national. So we gotta wrap our heads around the sovereignty issue for this region to really become. In terms of just CARICOM, if we stick to CARICOM, in terms of CARICOM becoming sustained. Just want you guys to comment on that, thanks. Sure. So let me uh, respond to that in three ways. I mean, firstly, uh, what you're saying on the, uh, the, the telecoms issue, calling Puerto Rico and it was still national, uh, but that's, what, that's what we're really trying to achieve with the single digital roaming charge. So you pay one fee and you could go anywhere in the Caribbean and you get a certain uh, standard uh, wh wherever you're going. And uh, I think we, we are making some progress along that to try and deal with that. Because I, you know, I remember in the early days going off to Trinidad or Antigua and coming back with the most horrendous bill um, uh, because I, I you know, got, didn't have my data roaming on or off or whatever it was. So um, that we are going to deal with that by having a single uh, data roaming charge. And um, the CARICOM is negotiating that with um, Digicel and Flow, and I, I think that, that we're going to get a, a positive outcome there. The, the telecoms companies uh, are, are in favor of something like that. The second thing, you talked about governance in CARICOM. One of the most important parts of our report is looking at the governance of CARICOM. Now, one of the reasons why CARICOM uh, is, is become synonymous with not moving you know, our, our, our report is called, uh, is, is called um, uh, Caribbean 9.58. Now, I, I don't know whether it's, it's uh, uh, I don't know whether that's an obvious title to everyone, but the reason why it's called Caribbean 9.58 is because we want to speed up the Caribbean. And 9.58 is the fastest man in the world's 100 meter run his world record, and he's Caribbean. So we can move fast. That's the idea of the report. And one of the ways in which we need to move fast is by addressing the governance in CARICOM. So we have proposing, one of our biggest proposals in the report is what's called, what we call enhanced cooperation, where there are 15 member states. But if five member states, just five, 
want to move ahead on an initiative, like a single data roaming charge, for instance, they can move ahead as long as what they're doing does not harm the other 10. A small number of, of more than five can move ahead. We're calling that enhanced cooperation. We think it will speed up the Caribbean. Because at the moment, 14 member states could agree with something, but one member state could disagree and nothing can move forward. And many of the things that are stuck in CARICOM have been stuck in CARICOM for too long. They've been, so they've been stuck for so long that they've now become out of date. Um, and, uh, and so we need to, to speed it up. Um, and it's not that there aren't people in the Secretariat or amongst the CARICOM governments who don't want to speed it up. It's that it's very hard to find unanimity on some of these complex issues. So if five or more states agree, we can move ahead. And I think that will move, that will move, uh, move, move the, the region faster. And my final point is you talked about, you know, why do we have all these different civil aviation authorities, national insurance schemes? Um, and I think that's a great point. And there are some places for which a single authority makes sense, maybe a single civil aviation authority. And if we had a single aviation authority, we could actually charge more for entering our space because you can't get around our space. If we're a single aviation authority, getting around our space is very expensive fuel wise. But if we are one national authority, getting around our space is not very expensive. And so we could actually end up with every country earning more money by having a single authority. But in some things like national insurance schemes, it may be that bringing them together allows us to create a market, a new market that will employ people and will actually be able to create uh, a greater energy in other areas. So imagine we brought all the national insurance schemes together they're probably going to have $25 billion of assets. We can then tender out for local fund managers to manage some of that money, to manage, say, the private part of that money, to manage, say, the growth and resilience part of that money. And we will create a market of asset managers. And because we've created a market for asset managers, these people will be hustling to find good investments anyway for other things. That's what Singapore did. Singapore used its national insurance scheme, which was modeled, in fact, on the Barbados national insurance scheme uh, when Lee Kuan Yew came and visited Barbados uh, in the 19, 1960s. Uh, he modeled his uh, scheme on the Barbados national insurance scheme, uh, and uh, they used it to create a local industry of fund managers, of asset managers. And now that created a lot of private sector dynamism of people whose job it is to go out and find savings and find investments and bring the two together. We don't have that industry in the region. And as a result, we've got too much savings and too few investments actually being done. We need to bring the two together. Okay, thanks for that. I, I understand that Chase is now ready to come on the floor. Well, pick yourself off the floor, Colvin. <laughs> COVID. Calvin has decided he no longer wants to speak. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, dear. You scared him away. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Calvin. <laughs> okay. We, well, we have um, we have a Christopher Harris with a raised hand. Great. Uh oh, there you go. Oh, oh, oh Calvin is here. Okay. Y yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, you. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um. So I. I, um, I, I'm interested in how you're going to go about uh, creating wealth, wealth creation. You're, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'll be hearing you. Yes. I had a question there in the uh, question and answer segment whereby was, I was basically contemplating how we will market uh, since traditionally in the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean um, uh, populations or people as a people are more susceptible to put money in a bank, traditional bank, uh, rather than take risks. They tend to be risk averse. So I was saying in basically in a nutshell that it needs to be a paradigm shift and it needs to be some sort of marketing to dislodge that um, line of thinking. So you have a new say, new dispensation, so to speak, or a new line of thinking uh, in order to prevail investment growth. Uh, in Barbados, the stock market is almost non-existent. And that was a good uh, lubricant 
to spread wealth around. But now we are having a lot of takeovers, acquisitions, and that wealth is now being repatriated, unfortunately. So I'm saying that in the, in the light of uh, risk averse, people are seeking safe haven and just keeping the money in the bank. And there's a lot of money stockpiling in the banks as opposed to, say, mutual funds or, uh, or the stock market. So I was putting that to Professor uh, Prasad as a finance man. What is the way forward? Because we have a lot of moving parts and the whole is greater than some of its parts. So maybe put Got the it. parts together to make sense. So you know we stand, you know where we fall. So Professor Prasad, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, got it. And a great question, Corbin. I don't think it is a, a lack of, of risk appetite. I think it's a classic example of a missing market. And we talked a bit about it earlier. We do not have intermediaries. We do not have a class of people whose job it is to come in every morning to find someone with savings and to go and find someone with a, a good investment opportunity. There are some of those companies in Jamaica. There's some of them in Trinidad. But as a region as a whole, we do not have hustlers who basically are hustling to find a good way of well, employing like sales. Term for us finance guys, but hustlers. Yeah. Hustlers is an impolite term for us finance guys. Well, I, I think that uh, they, they, we, we need to be impolite to the, to the sector sometimes. But, but yes, you're right. But, you know, someone who comes in every day and this job it is to be anxious about finding an investment. And I, I use the word hustler. And you're quite right. It is a slightly derogatory term because our bankers are not hustlers. Our bankers are not bothered about finding an investment opportunity, partly because they have found they are the only ones who have found alchemy. They have found a way of making money by doing nothing. You've got to put your money in the bank and they charge you. They give you no interest and they have so many charges that for the first time, when, when Justin and I were studying economics, banking was explained to us as you've got a cost of funding. You bring money in, you've got to pay people interest to bring the money. You take this money and because you've got a cost of funding, you've got to do something with the money. You've got to invest it. You've got to lend it out, right? So there's a cost of funding. Bankers have found a way of breaking that. So they've got the money coming in because you can't put your money stashed under a mattress. Um, you've got the money coming in and they charge you so many different charges. They don't need to do anything with the money. They're making a tidy return from just having deposits. And so we need to create a different industry whose job it is to, to be anxious that the money is not being used, it's not being mobilized. Uh, and I think that some markets need the state, almost every market actually needs a state to help it start. It's a bit of a misnomer that the entrepreneurs are private and, the, uh, and, and not in the state. The state creates entrepreneurship. And so one of the ways in which we can create a market is taking to, to uh, I forget whose point it was, it might have been, Fitzgerald's, uh, taking all of the national insurance funds, $25 billion across the region, and start bidding out who will manage the money. And you will create a market of hustlers who will come in every day to try and find investment opportunities. And that will get investment going up. We get no growth without investment. And we've got nobody who comes in every day. Well, I say nobody. We don't have enough people who come in every day, whose job it is, is to find investment opportunities. So we have savings sitting on bank accounts and invest, investment opportunities having to go abroad to find the money. It's weird. We go abroad to find investment and locally we have money sitting on the bank doing nothing. So that's the solution, I think. We yeah, need to create really that missing market. We want to agree with Abby because it's a question I always get because we do this regular stock market report. And I always struggle with the notion of these risk-averse Caribbean people. Because in a sense, retail investors around the world, individuals, are generally buy and hold investors. What really makes financial markets are those intermediaries, those institutional investors. And that certainly is a missing element in our market. Now we have a couple other hands. Um, Chris Harris, I saw that hand. We say Chris. Hi, good evening, Professor Prasad and Professor Justin. Can you hear me? Good evening, Christopher. We can hear you loud and clear. Great. So I wanted just to have 
uh, just to articulate on two points, more from the practical perspective. So with regard to intra-regional travel and food security within the Caribbean, which I think are two necessary uh, points that we can already discuss. And as I said, I wanted to speak more to the practical side of them. Uh, so just to give a bit of a background, we know that with regard to our cricket, I'm not sure, Ms. Professor Prasad, if you're a cricketer or you follow our cricket. Huge but you fan. Not cricket. I, I, I'm of that age. That's sad you're of that age, great. So one of, the, one of the major problems with our cricket is this I work called insularity, and it, it plays a, a, a very serious point in how we select our teams and how we, how we bat our teams coming from the various countries. So with, with regard to intra-regional travel, you did touch on the point where you stated that if we had one authority with regard to our airline, so for example, if Liat, well, Lia, and if they were servicing the entire Caribbean, we had one, Car we had one business model, or one entity providing service to towards the Caribbean. And then we have countries like Trinidad and Guyana, who are who are more oil rich, who can service the fuel aspect of it. It would make our costs within interregional travel lower. And I say this because I have friends who always say sometimes it's it's, it's cheaper to go to Miami than it is to go to Antigua. So I just wanted to know from a practical perspective, I know politics plays a part, but I wanted to know from a practical perspective, do we have any solutions or where are we with regard to making that more of a reality? And I also wanted, I know this is a fully loaded question, but I also wanted to know about the possibility of a, maybe a ferry, a ferry that can, I know it goes from, I know for St. Vincent, to Cam One and the small islands within the within St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but do you think there's there's a vision or ideology with regard to maybe a ferry that goes from Trinidad to Barbados, just as a way to reduce the cost because of all of the inherent problems we have with intra-regional travel? And then my last question was regard to food security, and we knew that COVID really impacted on supply chains and our abilities to have cargo moving to different countries and especially in Barbados where we, we, our agriculture sector is not as dominant as other other Caribbean countries I just want to know do you think it's time that we also look to maybe have for example in St. Vincent who produces a, a significant amount of things like green bananas is, is, is there ideology or philosophy where comparative advantage is given to countries who are endowed in specific areas so for example can it can can we envision a Caribbean where St. Vincent is supplying to the whole Caribbean with regards to green bananas and maybe Guyana, who I believe is endowed with things like rice and other uh, other commodities. Can we can we can we look forward to an ideology or philosophy, something that's actually practical, where these countries can actually supply within the Caribbean, reducing costs, creating linkages without insularity. And I know that's hard, but I just want to know: is there any practical solutions? I know in theory it makes sense, but do you think it is practical? And what are some of the hindrances to making that happen? So clearly, Chris has read the report, Avi, because those are two, two very important planks in the report. I, I, I don't know if you want to elaborate on them now, Avi, with the fast ferry and the whole issue of food security, because those are two, two of the key planks in the Private Sector Commission report. So, uh, and, and Chris is, uh, is also, it's also clear he's young because he's asked me so many questions it's impossible for me to remember them all at my age. Uh, but uh, I think the first one, um, we are one of the world's uh, most expensive regions to move around. So when you say sometimes it's more expensive to go to Antigua than Miami, it's not sometimes, it's often uh, the case. It, we are one of the most expensive places to move around. Now, there's some logistical reasons why, actually. Um, it's actually not easy for jet planes to have these short uh, takeoffs, short journeys, and short uh, landings. Um, uh, so there, there's some technical issues. Um, now, that's why we think fast ferries are a solution to that. And of course, we've had fast ferries successfully operating within some clusters of islands, but that's partly, again, technical reasons, that these aren't really blue ocean waters. And so the kind of ferry you need to operate within, say, some of the French islands um, are not the big super cats that you need to operate, say, between uh, St. Vincent and Grenada and Trinidad and Barbados. Uh, and these boats cost around 75 million US dollars. So part of the problem has been 
that the private sector is unable to invest that huge amount of money in a, in a, in a world of great uncertainty about petrol prices or in marine diesel oil. Uh, is what they use. So if, if we could find a way of uh, reducing that uncertainty, then we may be able to get the private sector to put up that money. So there is an initiative, um, uh, and, and it is one of our leading recommendations, uh, that we need to support the, the development uh, of a fast ferry network. It probably means buying one or two ferries. Uh, it, it means that the, the state will need to come in and provide some kind of guarantee. We've had a lot of strong interest, indeed, from some places um, in supporting that. Uh, and, and so I hope that will move further. We do need to do it. Now, one of the big advantages of doing that is to actually make the cost of cargo much cheaper, uh, cheaper and more frequent. Imagine that you could call a, a farmer in St. Vincent uh, now at 7 p.m. in Barbados and have a delivery at 10 a.m. tomorrow of fresh fruit, vegetables. Imagine I could call Trinidad today and get a delivery of some furniture tomorrow. Not next week, not next month, but tomorrow. That changes the market. So we think a fast ferry will be very important in reducing the cost of movement, but even more important uh, in reducing the cost of goods and cargo. And to get the fast ferry to work, you would need countries to agree to fast movements because there's no point in having a ferry that's going to uh, go to three or four countries in one day if it takes several hours to deal with immigration and customs. So, um, getting five countries say to move ahead fast on enhanced cooperation to agree some kind of a customs arrangement so a ferry can come in pull in and pull out in 20 minutes time can dramatically reduce the costs and speed uh, uh, and time for for cargo which will create markets but let me end with a with a controversial point i think it's romantic to talk about food security the reality is, in COVID, we did not really have food insecurity. We did not have a massive disruption of supply chains. We thought we would. One of my jobs was to call up the supermarkets every day for the first couple of weeks to try and find out where were the supply shortages. The government of Barbados was quite prepared to take extreme measures to bring in supply of food or anything that was in short supply. But within a couple of weeks, it became clear that there wasn't a supply disruption. I think we have a nutrition problem in the Caribbean rather than a food supply problem. We have food coming in. It ain't good food. It's a lot of processed food. It's getting our, our non-communicable diseases going sky high. And one of the reasons why is because the cost and speed of transport of fresh food. If you've only got a weekly container, you can't sell St. Vincentian green bananas to Barbados. So I think the fast ferry and the daily ferry allows some of these um, markets to grow. But I don't think, I, I, I think, and I think we should be prepared to put a tax uh, on processed foods because the health costs of these processed foods are huge or subsidize fresh foods uh, and that will encourage local production but i think the reality is you know in barbados two percent of our gdp is agriculture two percent the wages in the agricultural sector are very low if you want me to if you want to shift an economy uh, a, a clerical uh, person in Barbados in an air-conditioned office is earning considerably more than a farm laborer working under the hot sun a mile away from a board bathroom. Is that what you want to shift the economy into? So it's not clear. Now, there are parts of agriculture that are technology intensive, and maybe that's what we should be doing. But we need to be careful about being too romantic on food we have a problem with nutrition. We should subsidize fresh food and tax uh, processed food to deal with nutrition issues. But we don't have a problem that we, we don't have food. In, in, in Dominica, 
um, after the hurricane ripped up every single living thing uh, and meant that one of the foods, one of the greatest food self-sufficient countries in the world became non-food self-sufficient. Within 24 hours, they got food, airlifted in by the Barbados Defense Force from one of the world's least food self-sufficient countries, Barbados. So food security is not really a problem. Nutrition security is a problem. Are people eating the wrong foods? Let's use the tax system, the fiscal system, to encourage healthier food so we live longer. Okay, thanks for that, Prof. Always interesting as usual. I mean, I remember us having this debate 2008. Ideas always matter. And, you know, I, you know we, we, can, we, we have a lot of technical competence, but ideas are always critical. I have two persons on the floor with their hands up. So we have Anne Hamilton cutting, followed by Mawali Nath. Anne? So, so uh, I, I, I Anne or, Mawali is going to speak instead. Oh, Mawali is going to go instead. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Oh, good night, everyone. Hi. How are you? Hello. We can hear you well. Go ahead. You're on the floor. Well, really. Okay. I'm really loving the discussion, finding it very stimulating. Um, I'm really enjoying the banter as well. Um, I have three questions. Uh, my first question is really in relation to bonds. Um, it's really along the lines of when we do issue these bonds, how will, how will we essentially pay back for them? Um, and how will we make them attractive and feasible simultaneously? And how I see it too is, as you mentioned, we have a lot of money in the banks. We have a lot of money in insurance. Um, so how I think about it is that we could really just leverage the same money in the banks. Um, we institute or we implement the fractional reserve rate. So would it be unethical? Would it be wrong for countries to, I guess, use that money? Um, and why, why, why you say that? And why you bring ethics is because we, there, there's loads of bureaucracy already. There, there are loads of global watchdogs already. There are loads of regulation around that money, ensuring that it's, it's sustainable. Um, so, really is around leveraging that money that is already there instead of really issuing bonds, creating new financial instruments. And my second question, really two questions, sorry. Um, do you see interme intermediaries like banks slowing down the mobilizing of funds? And do you see a role for blockchain in this regard? I was recently listening to a seminar with the, I think he's the outgoing CEO of, of MasterCard, Anjay Banga. And he was talking about the cost of banks, um, how much money actually gets lost through intermediaries. And as, as we all know, that the creation of loans isn't always good because you're essentially creating money, creating new money. Um, so yes, those are my two questions in terms of the bonds. And then secondly, in terms of blockchain, um, in terms of intermediaries, um, I hope it was clear. Got it, got it. Uh, I, I, although I, I, I because um, maybe I'm simple, I see mm -hmm. three questions there rather than two. Okay. I see a, a first question about, you know, can we sort of go into the, to the banking system and direct some of that credit uh, to other things rather than having to issue bonds? Uh, secondly, if we are going to issue bonds, um, where will this, where, how will the bondholders be repaid? Good question. Um, and thirdly, uh, you're a bit concerned about the costs of the banking system and whether blockchain can help to reduce these costs in, in moving payments around. Great questions. I, I think I set up the problem as one of a missing market rather than the fact that the banks... Uh, the banking system is, is tied to the payment system. When a bank issues a loan, to you, uh, what they do is they don't take someone else's cash, they type it in. They create cash by giving you a loan. The, that loan is now becomes money. It becomes money because the bank can go off to the central bank 
and say, can I get some liquidity today? Uh, I've got two depositors asking for their money back and I'm a bit short of cash. I've got money, I've got, I've got money in loans, can I, but the, the loans are tied up. Can I take these loans and, uh, and, lend, and borrow some money from you, the central bank, against these loans I've got? And the central bank says yes on the basis that it regulates the banks. It knows that these loans are good loans. And so I think we've got, we've, it's very important. So the banking system is, is, it's critical that people make their own judgments on what is a good loan or not. And the minute the government starts getting involved in telling them what to do, when they lose money, they can then say, well, that wasn't to do with us. That's because you told us to lend to that person or you told us to lend to that person. And then the, the whole, financial system becomes effectively socialized and, and the, the government and the taxpayers become sort of on the hock for any mistakes. So I would rather try to make sure that we aren't disincentivizing the banks from lending. But if the banks are not lending, let's create some new markets uh, which will lend. Uh, so investment markets. And what would happen is depositors would say, would keep some cash in the bank to be liquid but then take some of their savings and go to a fund manager who will offer them a higher rate of return. And these fund managers are going to be hopefully specialists looking for good things to invest in. And that's critical for the bonds to be repaid. There's no point tapping money, in call it, wrapping it into a bond, nice technical, sophisticated term. It's got to make money uh, because otherwise you can't pay back a higher rate of interest. We can't co say, complain that depositors are getting nothing on their savings, they should invest in bonds, but the bonds have to earn a better rate of return. So it's very important. And that's why uh, when Senator Drake's called and talked about the circular economy, we need, we need rating systems that will help to classify things as good investments or at least sustainable investments to help direct that money to things that will earn a return as well as being sustainable. Can blockchain help? Um, I, I think it would be wrong to think that technology uh, is the solution for everything. I think blockchain can help in payments. It can create more competition and reduce the cost of payments. Banks can use, use blockchain too. Banks are probably some of the biggest users of blockchain. Um, and uh, I think that the reason why bank charges are very high is not really about the technology they're using. In fact, their technology is faster than blockchain today. They use gross real-time settlement. Blockchain uh, is not gross real-time settlement, um, uh, as in as an instantaneous settlement. So um, I think that uh, I, I think the reason why charges are high is because it's not competitive. Uh, and we need as regulators to try and make sure our, our markets are competitive or if we can't make sure they're competitive, then the regulator needs to get involved in these charges. And, and we've been trying to urge the banking regulator and now the new payments regulator to, to, to actually have a position on charges. We should probably say that charges can't be above X. We should put a cap on charges. That's what they do in the European Union. Now, the European Union is a big market. They've got some market power. But I think we could, we could uh, try and use leverage what has happened in other jurisdictions. Take the caps in the US market and the European market and say to MasterCard and Visa and anybody that your charges must be capped at the same rate. So we're not asking them to be lower, but at the same rate. Uh, and I think that that is the way we can get, and more competition. So the government of Barbados is trying to encourage M-Pesa to come into the market. Uh, we have M-Money, uh, we have WePay around the region. There, there are no, a growing number of people increasingly using blockchain. And that more competition in payments, I think is a good thing and it should lower costs, but it's competition that's doing it, not the technology. Okay, I mean, just to continue along that line, I mean, I think the underlying issue here, part of it is, is the whole payment settlements across the region and, and the costs involved with that. I know if we go way back, 60s, 70s, there was the Caribbean clearing facility, which, which didn't end very well. 
You know, some, some very good work done by Marion Williams. Now, in terms of your report, because I know one of the ideas around are these central bank digital currencies where you can have settlement across the region done via these mechanisms. Does the report speak to that and across the region, whether digital or face-to-face -face commerce? So um, there's some great work being done by Mala Dukaran and other people on trying to create a Caribbean settlement system. Uh, I've been trying to, to, to encourage them to, to think about being an entirely private sector system. That there is a fair bit of, 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 of trade that can be netted. And trade that can be netted, I think, can be settled very inexpensively. Um, we don't actually need physical settlement. Uh, it is the non, the, the, the bits that can't be netted off. So, you know, Barbados and Trinidad, Barbados exports tourism to Trinidad, Trinidad exports manufactured goods. A good 30% of the trade can be netted off and matched with each other. And then there's a balance and the balance may have to go through the US dollar. But if we dealt, dealt with all of the net, all the trade that can be netted off, you, you need some kind of, of, of third party currency to work out exactly how much is being netted. Um, uh, and that's how the euro was born. The European currency unit was that, cur that currency they used to net off transactions. Um, but uh, we, we can then actually reduce the amount that we use the US dollar uh, significantly. Uh, and that should also reduce the costs of, of, of settlement. So I think that this is, a, this is a, a problem an opportunity crying out for a private sector solution uh, and government should try and support it and encourage it. But if you want the governments to get involved in driving the system, I think they are likely to take longer to get that right. Okay, and we sort of winding down now. We've been going at this for near two hours. So I, I sort of want to throw a slightly different question at you, Avi. And it started coming when we had a discussion of food security, because whatever we do in the region, we are operating in a global space and the effects of competition and technology will mean that players at different points in the value chain are gonna be earning different levels of income. So I think as you can kind of highlight it, do we really wanna transition persons from being office workers to lowly paid agricultural workers Many aspects of the gig economy are at the lower level. So the way I tend to think of the problem, and in a way, having a session with you is, a, in a way, puts a, to me, is a very good imagery of it. How do we create Caribbean citizens that are globally competitive, that can earn at the high end of the value chain? I think the old adage that we've always said that our main resource is our people, I mean, it's a bit of a passive thing to say, but there is quite a large element of truth in that. So, and I think in many ways, the development challenge, a large enough mass, a critical mass of Caribbean citizens who are capable of earning at the higher end of the value chain in their chosen field of endeavor. And does the report address this issue? Or if not, are there any ideas you or any thoughts you want to express in that area? So COVID has brought the future to the present. If you go after this call, not now, uh, if you go after this call to upwork.com, you will see the future. In upwork.com, a bunch of countries mainly English-speaking countries, so that's useful to us given we're so bad at languages, basically make a list of all the different services, professional services they need, accounting, legal, design, software development, um, virtual assistance, and people from around the world bid for that work. That's the future, and that's global. That's a global platform. Now, the question is, how do we position our people on that platform to be earning them the best wages? That means they need to have um, internationally accredited skills. That when they go on upwork.com 
and they put in what is in their CV that someone in uh, Ohio, someone in Saskatchewan understands what, what that qualification means. So we need to, to have internationally accredited professional qualifications. We need great broadband for them to access Upwork to be able to uh, uh, to be moving back and forth data easily, cheaply. And so we need to negotiate with our telecoms providers that we have great and cheap and fast broadband of high quality. We've got fiber optic in Barbados, so that helps out. Not everywhere uh, across the Caribbean. And that will allow us to be global players. But I think the, what is the regional component here? It allows us to be well positioned as consumers benefiting from a globalized, digitized world. But how do we be winners in this world as opposed to just participants? And the way is that we actually start being um, producers of great, rare quality product. We need software designers we need developers we need app developers and how do they become that not simply by doing an online course most learning is not by school it's by doing if our people are getting uh, only getting experience by getting work done on upwork they're not going to develop that track record to compete with someone else to earn a higher wage so we actually need to create a regional market in these things. So our people will now have, through learning by doing, actual experience of writing apps. Now they could go on Upwork and say, oh, I've written the, the software that does all the audits for the NIS of Barbados. I've written the software that you know, does uh, digital payments instantaneously from the social security system in Dominica to every beneficiary within five seconds. So we need to create those markets. We need to create, and we need to do that. Those markets need to be big enough. So we need to create regional markets. And that's why the digital single space is so important. It's not just a nice combination of letters and words. It will actually give our people the track record, give our people the experience and the learning that when they go on the global platform, see upwork.coms and those versions they can compete with the best not with the worst they can compete at the top not compete at the bottom because the gig economy has few winners and many many losers the producers are losers the consumers are winners so how do we become a winning producer what has what has uber done to the rates of taxi drivers it's collapsed rates of taxi drivers so we need to be a winner in this gig economy, not a loser. And the way is we need to have uh, nurture and develop and deepen these regional markets. So our people are going onto the global markets with some great track record and experience. Does that make sense? Oh, no, that makes perfect sense. And I think we, I'd actually like for us to wrap up our discussion on that note. This is an extremely important juncture in Caribbean history. I think this is an extremely important report. It's one of the best reports I've seen coming out of CARICOM. And I think it can be a catalyst for the transformation of the region. I started the webinar by using the commission's own words to really paint the picture of the way the region has been underperforming. It is not enough though for us to sit on the outside and say CARICOM doesn't get anything done and that these reports are dead, most of the persons on this call, and I hate to use the word determined, they, they, they are influencers, uh, they, they are influencers in their own way. And I would like to charge you with using your influence to really to make the publics across the region in the this report that can go a long way 
towards driving the revitalization of the region. I would like to really, on behalf of you, really want to thank you, Avi, and your team for the excellent work that has been done there. And I think it's the job of us as Caribbean citizens who are interested in a better region to take, to do our bit to advocate to ensure that this report doesn't suffer the fate of many of the reports that have gone before and that they really become a call and a blueprint for action. Again, Avi, I'm going to give you the final word. Any final comments? So my, my I'm not going to make any final comment or point, but I'm going to remind uh, the audience of the very illustrious set of commissioners. I was extremely honored and privileged uh, and very lucky to have had a great set of commissioners. Uh, the uh, Ngozi, Okonjo Iwelia, the new uh, first uh, woman head of the, uh, of the WTO, uh, was one of our commissioners, as was Pascal Lamy, a, a previous head of the WTO. Uh, Therese Turner-Jones, uh, our own, from, who's currently the country regional director of the Inter-American Development Bank. Damien King uh, of, uh, of UE in, in Mona. Um, Gregory Maguire, who is a, an economist with a strong background in infrastructure uh, and project development. Uh, Roger McLean, who is uh, uh, a, a one of the specialists in the health, um, uh, health uh, public health uh, in UE, very apt and important uh, field, uh, given what was happening with COVID. And Wendell Samuels, a senior economist at CARTAC uh, in, at, the, at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, so we had a great set uh, of commissioners that did a fantastic job, very well supported by the CARICOM Secretariat, uh, Evelyn uh, Wayne, and I thank them all for doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks for the opportunity to tell you about the commission's work. Okay, and, and th thanks again. Thanks for the audience. None of this is possible without the audience. I know you've been reading, if, you, if you've been half awake in the press, in the region, you've been reading a lot about UWI in the press. But we are here to serve you, and we at the Sajiko Cooper School of Business, we stand committed to hosting forums that, uh, and our niche, there's a lot going on, but our niche is really trying to promote the private sector and private sector-led led growth across the region. So again, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening and we look forward to hosting you on one of our future webinars. Thank you very much.